very much, uh, Anita. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Buyo Tegyan. I'm the manager for monitoring and evaluation at the Jobs Fund. I'm thrilled to welcome each and every one of you today um, to this webinar. Thank you for joining us as we delve into the world of microfinance and explore the results of the Jobs Fund's forage into this space as well as the emerging impacts that we have realized with our partners from Pagamani. Pagamani means arise. It is an admonition to stand and be counted, to take control of one's destiny and to live to your best potential. We will see this afternoon that this is a call that the participants of the Pagamani project have indeed embraced and continue to strive toward. Before we begin, let me give you a brief uh, overview of what you can expect from today's presentation. We will start by providing you with a concise history of uh, microfinance institutions and their significance in addressing financial inclusion. From there, we will shift our focus to the Pakamani project and its unique delivery model inspired by the renowned Grameen Bank approach to lending. As we explore the Pakamani project, you will gain insights into how this microfinance initiative has played a pivotal role in empowering women. By employing a sector-specific approach towards lending, Pakamani ensures that funds are exclusively directed towards women entrepreneurs, enabling them to start and grow their own businesses. This targeted approach has not only provided financial support, but also fostered a sense of autonomy and self-reliance amongst women. The stories of these courageous women will inspire you and showcase the transformative power of microfinance. One of the key challenges faced by microfinance project is the cost of servicing rural areas. During our presentation, we will dive into this critical aspect and highlight the strategies and innovations employed by the Pakamani project to overcome these challenges. By employing technology, partnerships, and community-based support systems, Pakamani has managed to extend its reach and delivery um, of financial services efficiently to some of the most remote areas in the country. In conclusion, Today's presentation promises to be an insightful journey, delving into the fascinating world of microfinance and focusing on the remarkable work done by Pagamani. We hope that by the end of this webinar, you will leave with a deeper understanding of the important role microfinance plays in providing a pathway to financial inclusion and empowering women entrepreneurs. Once again, we extend our warmest welcome to all the participants. In the interest of delivering a seamless presentation, all mics will be muted. Participants are encouraged to post their questions on the chat and the Pakamani and Jobs Fund teams will do their best to respond to your questions and queries. We will allow for further questions during our Q&A segment, which will be toward the end of the session. In our Q&A segment, participants will then be able to raise their hands and their mics will be unmuted to allow for verbal questions. Now, without further ado, I invite my esteemed colleague, Nazim Hendricks, who will also be the facilitator for Leo, you muted yourself. Apologies. Oh my goodness. Um, have I been mute the whole time? No, just when you said you're inviting um, ah. Nazim. Yes. Okay, apologies. Um, Nazim, over to you. Thank you very much, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and a warm welcome again from my side to, to everybody on the school. We hope that you will find today uh, firstly inspiring and also very informative as to what the work of the Jobs Fund, and in this case specifically with the Pakamani Foundation as our partner. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? 
So very briefly, as a background to the Jobs Fund, uh, we were established in uh, 2011 and capitalized at 9 billion with a specific aim of testing innovative approaches to job creation by sharing risk with partner organizations, particularly within the private sector, and in, thereby encouraging wide and market adoption of both the challenge fund uh, uh, instrument as well as incurring the adoption of successful job creation by organizations, by ones of state and, and the overall market. Now, I think we, one must make the point that the jobs fund is not a mass employment program, right? Um, however, our role is there to complement other government programs who may be uh, mass employment programs by encouraging innovation um, and sustainable job creation by finding that better way of doing things and then enabling the rest of the market to follow suit and, and, and pull back better. Uh, the fund works with intermediaries of which Bakamani Foundation today is one of them, leveraging their network and expertise and scope to access and provide support to our targeted beneficiaries. Now, very importantly, and this webinar is part of this process that the Jobs Fund has established a knowledge sharing agenda as one of our foundational pillars. Um, and this is supported by a rigorous monitoring uh, and evaluation and reporting framework, um, which governs the way we measure impact and, and also events like uh, th this particular webinar. Um, to this end, the jig, okay, I've, I've said that, so I'm not going to go there. And I think. If we go to the next slide, please, I think we, you're not here to listen to me today. I think you, you, you're here to listen to our partner and I want to introduce, and it's my pleasure to do so, to introduce the, the team from the Pakamani uh, uh, Foundation, a jobs fund partner um, that are represented by the Chief Executive Officer, Eric Crawford, uh, Kudzai Rujua, the Finance Manager at at Pakamani and also Mitchell Clef Blanche, who acts as a project manager within Pakamani. So Pakamani, the slogan on their website speaks to the transformation of entire communities is measured one family at a time. And giving effect to that thus far, Pakamani has issued 550,000 loans to 185,000 uh, uh, beneficiaries, female beneficiaries. And I currently have just over 36,000 active clients. Uh, but I think the, the most important point to make is that the repayment rate on those loans currently per their website is at 98%, um, which gives us a bit of sense because it has always been regarded as a highly high risk area and an area for institutions not to, 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 to play in because of the risk. Well, Bakamari has shown, if done correctly, with the right support packages surrounding the, the, the funding, this can be done. So without further ado, I will hand over to, to Eric um, and Kuzai, who will be leading us in today's presentation. Thank you. Eric. Thank you, Nazim. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a privilege to be presenting to you today, and I, I certainly hope that you benefit from this time spent with us. To start, um, the best place to hear from is indeed our clients, and we've got a short documentary or video that was produced from a, by a team who came out from the US and went into the field and spent a week with our clients and, and put this together. So if we could show the video and then we'll take you through a presentation thereafter. South Africa is incredibly beautiful. I love the diversity of South Africa. So much money and capacity flows through this country, yet it seems to all stick in the first world part of South Africa. Poverty in South Africa is heartbreaking. 
it's life changing to see how people live on a daily basis, the struggles and the difficulties. There was no understanding of tomorrow. It's it's only about today because I only have enough for today. Our mission is to empower the poor, to provide them with training and support, to allow them to take out their first business loan and then to stay with them and walk with them and help them to succeed. That's what we do. My name is Chula Semelani. I am self-employed. I'm a single mother. I'm staying in my home. I'm working in my home. And I love my business. I love it. It's in, it's in me. I think it's, I'm blessed with it. I used to keep on praying that one day I'm, I'm going to have a boutique, my own boutique at town. It's my dream. It's my talent. And I've never been to school. I, I make everything, whatever you want, I, I do it. We believe that poor people are as gifted you know, as those people, we may say they are educated, but they haven't had opportunities in life. Pocket money provides a hand up. Provide credit, provide training, as well as ongoing support to women in rural communities as a way of trying to empower them to be self-sustainable. Pocket money is a statement. It's a statement that I care. It's an organization uh, founded by Mark and Shirley Tucker to improve the lives of women and, and to eradicate poverty in, in South Africa where we can. We do that through the issuing of microfinance to poor women, exclusively women, that are willing to help themselves. In many instances, our, our clients is women who are heading uh, households without a father figure in the home and you have children. I have to put food on the table. I have to clothe them. Yeah, Moba is cutting the senior bandu and another be a school in Bertulangana Wood. Kobe Plumje Vale are cool. Yeah. Mankum Bulemova Vele go Lexella Dium Vit are cool. Abona are you going to lip soon Jen Xella in the Lal? Maswela logo ni yangu tayari nzima yangu lala iba legega kuu. Tola kuti kuu la guko, ene awatu sio tola api, ene. There's a situation that we got hold of where women were actually eating toothpaste just so that they could have a meal. You don't eat, but the kids must eat. Women are the bedrock of our society here. Paramani believes that through a woman, uh, a lot can be changed. So we believe that if you give a woman uh, something, she will share with the whole family. I haven't been to a single center client meeting where there aren't kids, young kids. So it's either mothers or grandmothers running a business and looking after their kids. They're entrepreneurs because they have to be. These people are not poor because they chose to be poor. It's some, sometimes it's circumstances that uh, they did not choose to find themselves in. We have those minds, we have those ideas, but we don't know where to go with those ideas. With the background that we have in, in Africa, where things seem to favor mostly men, and women don't really get to benefit that much. They typically are unbanked and cannot get access to funds any other way. Some loans I didn't qualify. In South Africa, for you to be able to, to go and get a loan at a bank, you need to have a pay, a paycheck. I'm self-employed, you see. So when I go out for a bank, I'm looking for a loan. Why is your pay slip? No pay slip. We at Pagaman, we give them a lifeline. We give them small loans to fund their small business. The interests are not that much. I, I, I am able to manage. Well, our repayment rate is, is 98% or above. Often it's 99. You meet clients, you know, in their working environments, in their homes, in their villages, and get to see how hard they work, the conditions they work under, 
and the selfless way in which they work to improve the lives for their, not just for themselves but for their families is, is, is really uplifting. Beyond their willingness and their desire to succeed, which everything starts there, is training. We provide them support, make sure that we help them understand business principles. Centers are a place for skills training. It's a place for us to train, but also for our clients to train themselves. When we issue a loan to them, we don't ask for collateral. The guarantee that we have is the group guarantee. Because I think I, I, I will not able to take it Pagamani alone. Yes, the Pagamani need us to be a group. Through holding themselves accountable. And that group must be a people that will trust them. One person looking at another person and saying, if you get in trouble, I'll help you. People that you have to, to speak to them to, 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 and to encourage them. You can do this, you can do this. The loan that the client pays back, the money that the, the client pays back, it helps another client. That's the thing that I really appreciate more than anything is that they're doing it themselves. It's mine. I'm proud of it. And I like it. I love to, to, do, this, to do this job. I'm proud, definitely. Right. I hope you enjoyed that. There was a bit of a lag. I think that's networks, but I think you got the picture. And yeah, certainly what keeps us coming to work every day. So just a brief background. Uh, microfinance has been around since the 18th century, and it was established um, really to help people out of poverty and, and particularly um, uh, farmers and small businesses. Um, the success of that, and, and as Nazim alluded to, the, the, the high level of repayment from, from poor people led to its growth in the 1970s. And the primary goal has always been for, from nonprofit organizations, has always been social in the form of uh, poverty alleviation and access to, to, to financial services, in this case, particularly uh, capital. Became more formalized, uh, allowing people to take reasonable small business loans safely and in a manner that is consistent with ethical lending practices as opposed to loan sharks or as we know them, Mashadisa. Typically, uh, microfinance operations occur predominantly in developing nations. So across the world, South and Southeast Asia make up about 73% of the total borrowers around the world. Latin America, 16%, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, 6%, and then Middle East and uh, North Africa, around 3%. Uh, the balance coming from Europe and Central Asia. Over time, these markets have continued to grow. Um, they estimated in 2022 at around $187 billion and expected to grow to about $488 billion by 2030. Um, and according to the World Bank, about 500 million people have directly or indirectly benefited from microfinance related operations. And it's very important to note that there is a secondary beneficiary in all these instances, particularly when servicing um, a woman micro entrepreneurs in that what comes out of the business uh, gets shared amongst um, at least the family and further into the community. So initially focused on loans and credits, um, globally 
uh, institutions have become banks where they can and they offer savings account, current accounts, micro insurance and, and fund transfers would sort of be the full ambit of, of microfinance. Um, with that, uh, globally, and this is important to note because we are a bit different as, as Pagabani and indeed in, as development microfinance in South Africa, in that um, organizations have moved to for-profit uh, which comes with bigger loans and often with individual lending. So they've moved up, up that pyramid. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kudzai Bidjur, once again. And um, just to uh, add on to what my colleague Eric has shared with you. Uh, firstly, based on the stats that uh, Eric has just shared, it is unfortunate that uh, overall Sub-Saharan Africa only takes up 6% of the global share in the microfinance sector. And this is despite studies showing that in many developing countries, a correlation exists between microfinance and poverty reduction. Now, while many regions around the world have experienced a decline in extreme poverty, which the World Bank defines as living off approximately 750 rands per month, Sub-Saharan Africa region seems to have regressed over the years with an estimated 62% of people living in extreme poverty. Now, development microfinance institutions were set up to pursue the social and developmental goal of poverty reduction, as mentioned by Eric. And this is done by providing access to financial services to the poor and the unemployed, enabling beneficiaries to set up income-generating micro-businesses which we, we do not view as micro-businesses only, but as nano-businesses, because nano-businesses are, are a hidden dimension of SMMEs. Now, this term is more popular in countries like Australia and in Nigeria, where nano-businesses are seen as way below the micro-enterprise category. Now, furthermore, development microfinance seeks to curb inequality in the income distribution which we all know is currently at its highest in South Africa at 63% as measured by the Gini coefficient indicator. DMFIs advocate for financial inclusion, as already mentioned, which comprises the promotion, the promotion, creation, and provision of affordable financial products and financial services, which are, my colleague also mentioned, savings, credit, insurance, underwriting, and financial investment opportunities to all individuals. True to the spirit of this webinar, gender inequality uh, is also an issue that microfinance institutions seek to correct. Women play a significant role in economic development and DMFIs recognize that. DMFIs are meaning developmental microfinance institutions. 53% of borrowers globally in 2022 were women. In South Africa, over 90% of the sector's clients are women, while that's 100% for Pagamani Foundation, which we believe if you empower the woman, you've empowered the entire household, as was uh, pointed out in the video. Now, in summary, and to the point of departure for me, uh, DMFI aim to address the problems related to poverty, inequality, and income distribution, financial inclusion and gender inequality right at the bottom of the pyramid. Thanks, Kurt. Um, I see there's a question in the chat. Um, do we want to, or do you want that answered now or should we continue with the presentation, uh, Nazim? I think, I think, Eric, if you can just answer that and then move on, please. Okay, super, thanks. All right, I'll answer that first. I'll take that on. Um, in as far as uh, the success of an MFI is concerned, uh, it would be better understood if we first spoke about mission drift. While access to credit is pivotal in, in poverty alleviation, many microfinance institutions globally have over the years suffered criticism for failure to remain focused on their social objective, which is to concentrate on adjusting their returns on social portfolio. And instead, they shift to commercialization, which is the application of market-based principles to meet 
uh, shareholder or finan uh, financial objective. Now, for an MFI to be successful, a balance needs to be struck between what we term outreach and operational self-sustainability. Now, this is called the trade-off theory in microfinance. And outreach, basically, this is the, the there are two most well-known indicators for microfinance institutions that are classified under outreach, and that is breadth and depth of outreach. Depth of outreach refers to the types and levels of poverty of clients supported by MFIs. And when we say types and levels of poverty, we are referring to uh, the, the, societal, the, the societal factors that are considered when you look at the depth and the impact uh, that the, 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 the poor are, are, are faced with. For example, is it female clients? Where do these people reside? Is it in rural areas? So that's what we call um, the, the, the depth of outreach. The breadth of outreach refers to the number of active clients served by microfinance institutions. So outreach, in a nutshell, considers the number of clients served by microfinance institutions and how poor they are and their social uh, class. Are they women? Are they, uh, are they residing in, a, in an area that has got uh, basic serv services and facilities? So that's the first element. The second element that we consider for a successful microfinance enterprise is the financial sustainability, which is measured by operational self-sustainability. And this refers to the company's capacity to earn enough revenue to cover all of its costs. Operational self-sustainability is essential for assessing an MFI's capacity to operate sustainably over the long term while carrying out its social mission. Great, thanks, Kurt. Um, so if we can continue on the slide, and the next slide, which is up. Um, in the late 1970s, Professor Muhammad Yunus um, in Bangladesh, uh, in response to extreme levels of poverty, financial exclusion, and inequality, which Kurt has just alluded to, developed what is known as the Grameen um, Group Lending Methodology. Now, Grameen means village, and, and he started servicing micro-business, uh, women in micro-business in a Bangladeshi village in that time. He hoped to provide business loans at reasonable risk, again alluding to what um, Kutis just said, uh, and, and, and low rates so that they were affordable for people. I had a bit, um, the privilege of meeting Professor Yunus a few years back, and he, he strongly believes that poverty belongs in, in museums and that people that empower themselves in business rather than looking for, for permanent jobs is a great way of, of alleviating and reducing levels of poverty. In 2006, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work on economic and social development. So we've mentioned the key components, um, capital savings and credit. Uh, what we didn't mention or hadn't mentioned yet is financial education. And this is an important part of what we do. So financial inclusion needs to go beyond pure access to finance and into how do you use your money best. And we'll talk more to that just now. At short-term loans, um, typically four to six months, in the year, uh, collateral is social collateral, so it's held across the members of the group and indeed within a centre, as, as Nazim mentioned. Um, and then there's biannual, uh, bi-monthly or monthly centre meetings. These are chaired by clients. It's not a Pagamani meeting. Um, that we, we train up centre leadership to manage and host those meetings. And... Um, and, and then just facilitate the admin in those meetings. Included in those meetings, it's, it's a place where we don't handle cash. So in those meetings, we will collect slips. We will disperse um, in, the, in, the, in the form of letting the group know that the funds will be available in their bank for withdrawal. Um, and then it's also a second level of solidarity, client solidarity and support. Um, and generally, the group lending, as, as Kutzi also mentioned, is predominantly aimed at women. 
In Pagavani, it's exclusively uh, aimed at women. Next slide, please. Okay, so microfinance, uh, microcredit started in South Africa in 1987. Um, and just to clarify, globally, microfinance is, is um, what we talk to in terms of business loans um, to, to disadvantaged or marginalized people. Um, but in South Africa, there is a second, there, there, there are you know, microfinance institutions, several thousand. Um, they differ from us in that they are primarily focused on um, consumption lending and that the businesses have a profit motive, whereas the development microfinance focuses on an income generating activity, i.e. a small business, financial inclusion and poverty alleviation. Since 1990, over 45 DMFIs have started operations and closed down um, in that period. And currently there are only three um, development microfinance institutions operating. Some of the key reasons for that is, is the high cost to serve? And we will delve into more of that in detail. Um, maybe some financial discipline or in indiscipline and, and poor governance. Research was done on this a couple of years back, and, and those were the key findings. So in those three, um, three organizations, the one that we opened um, 32 years ago, Small Enterprise, Enterprise Foundation, they have about just under 150,000 clients. Uh, then Pagamani Foundation sitting at around 36,000 clients, and a relative, uh, we 15 years old this year. And then Sunrise Women's Development started about two years back uh, in KZM, and they've got about 2,000 clients. All of those organizations um, have applied some derivative of um, the group lending methodology as established by Grameen Bank. So I see a question um, from Natabo. Natabo, uh, I will answer that in a minute if you if you don't mind, I will get your question in, one, in the next slide. So we operate across as a as a as a dissociate, as a group of MFIs, DMFIs. We operate across seven provinces, uh, servicing about 221,000 clients, um, 1.3 billion dispersed annually. That was as high as 2 billion uh, prior to COVID. Uh, a gross loan book um, of 500 million. Also, it was touching on 750 million prior to COVID. Um, cumulatively, our clients have savings around 76 million. We don't mandate savings, but we do encourage it as part of the financial discipline. Um, from inception, 17.3 billion has been dispersed, and the sector employs about just under 1,300 people. Uh, the products are all for uh, credit for business purposes, with primary, primary, primary objectives being financial inclusion and poverty reduction. Um, I'm going to speed up a bit because I see we, we are going to run short of time otherwise. Could I have the next slide, please? So just to give you a bit of a picture of what we've been through over the last couple of years, um, the graph represents um, the growth load portfolio, um, and then I've just showed Pagamani on there as well. So you'll see the sector was growing well um, up until 2020, um, just given that these are as at June of each year because all of the organizations in the sector have a June financial year in. And you can see, so, so 2021 wasn't impacted too badly, but then 22, 23, we've seen a continued reduction. And really where the, the issues came in, in uh, during COVID, reduced areas to operate, so schools closed, women who were uh, running tuck shops or, or banking school uniforms, obviously that, that impacted them. 
also those servicing uh, tertiary institutions, um, prohibition of, of, of large gatherings. So big gatherings in the year, like um, the ZCC gathering in the Popo and, and Shemby gatherings in KZN, is a prime area for clients to sell. Some clients work a big chunk of the year just to prepare product for those meetings, and those weren't allowed. And then obviously house to house uh, sales were impacted. Uh, issues around restocking um, because of the restrictions on travel. A lot of our clients um, in the rural areas will go to the main centers to, to, to buy bulk stock and then, and then uh, take it back to their, their businesses in the rural areas. They too, as in our clients, customers were under pressure. And so our clients that operate on credit or a level of credit um, saw an increase in defaults, uncertain and volatile conditions. We just experienced a general uh, loss of confidence in starting a new business. Um, yeah, and then obviously lower, lower volumes. Prior to post-COVID, if I can say post-COVID, we saw uh, the market improving um, and then dropping again. And, and that's in 2023, primary things that we believe have, have impacted um, our clients, load shedding, um, and, and people in, in rural areas are impacted significantly by load shedding. Uh, those that are cooking or selling meals, stowing, uh, selling uh, meat products where they need a freezer or fridge for cold drinks, all of those businesses were significantly impacted. And, and just, uh, I think many people think of a Spaza shop when they think of the clients we serve. A Spaza shop might carry 50 to 100 different lines of product, whereas our clients may only have three to, to 10 lines of product. So if a couple of those are impacted, it impacts the whole business. And then just generally lower levels of disposable income in the rural areas, obviously impacting um, our clients' customers. You can go to the next slide. So just um, continuing, I've included Pagamani's um, uh, history in terms of the loan, loan book in the presentation for two reasons. One, to show that the size of Pagamani in the market. So, so while we're the second biggest player, uh, we're still smaller, significantly smaller than SEF. But also the fact that we haven't had the same level of um, drop-off in the years 22 and 23. Big reason for that is that we continue during that time and, and through COVID to open branches. And that's on the back of the partnership we have with the Jobs Fund. So it really has enabled us through the partnership to continue in some very tough times. But then if we go on to, to where we are today, the increased cost of living, so cost of fuels, transport and materials, as I mentioned, clients will often have to pay transport to get through to the, the economic centers and, and buy a product to bring it back. Um, they are unable to increase their prices at, at the same rate as their input costs, which obviously affects their profitability and margins. Um, Customers, our clients' customers or beneficiaries' customers are also starting to buy in bulk as a way of saving because obviously the, the um, flexibility of buying from, from somebody in the community comes at a bit of a, a premium. And then there was a significant increase. Many, many clients bank with Postbank. It's got the biggest footprint because it came off the back of the post office. Um, but in 2020, the postbank moved from a flat fee of 16 rand per withdrawal to a um, escalating fee along the lines of the commercial banks, um, and that made it significantly more expensive for our clients to bank. Um, clients have challenges in opening and operating bank accounts, uh, load shedding being one of those. Um, because these aren't the most profitable bank accounts, um, some banks you know, don't encourage it. Every group account, because they open a group savings account, uh, means opening uh, a FICA for each of the individuals in the account, which is time consuming. 
You also noted an increased level of crime uh, with the economic conditions in rural areas, um, and then increased level of service delivery action. Um, and we expect that to, to probably get worse leading up to the elections next year. And then a proliferation of, of strip malls um, going quite far into some of the more rural areas. Um, next slide, please. So now just into, into um, Pagamani itself. Um, we started dispersing in 2008. Um, we currently operate, well, we started in Mpumalanga, then Limpopo, uh, with a jobs fund into KwaZulu Natal, and, and currently we've expanded into the Eastern Cape uh, in our current project with a jobs fund. Uh, we currently have 55 branches nationally and about 385 employees. Um, if you just look at the um, the graph, which I hope is clear, the number of loans dispersed per year, which is one of our measures, you'll note quite a steep increase from 20, 2015, 16, 17. And that's on the back of the KwaZulu Natal expansion, uh, in addition to a couple of branches opened in Limpopo. Um, distinct impact of COVID um, 2019 to 2020 given that we were impacted for three months in 2020, um, with one of those months being a hard lockdown during which um, we closed operations and sent our staff home, um, and then continuing into 21, um, largely COVID, and then starting to grow again, that's, that 21-22 uh, is phase one of a current jobs fund project, uh, and then that dip into 23, um, which is where we are currently, and, and that, we believe, is largely due to, to some of the factors I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, primarily economic, um, and we're looking to ways to address that. Um, and I've seen a bit of a positive trend in the last two months, which is awesome news for us, because it means clients' businesses are starting to, to improve profitability. As, as you mentioned, 36,000 clients, 185,000 individual women served since we opened 15 years ago. Uh, we've dispersed 1.3 billion from inception, but that has, has grown exponentially in that we currently disperse just under two a quarter of a billion a year uh, into the most remote rural areas of, of South Africa. Um, and then again, um, as in spoke to the total number of individuals through the group loans. Next slide, please. Questions? Um, so, um, we mentioned that we would talk to, Boyer mentioned the, the high cost of lending and how this works. And it, it really is a high cost model in that it's, um, we have in each of our branches, which has a branch of it, uh, which only happens, uh, meetings happen once a week and they're largely administrative and some training, but otherwise our staff are on foot out in the communities that we serve. Um, so recruitment happens door to door, uh, motivations of gatherings of women at churches or social events. Uh, we do distribute pamphlets, uh, particularly in new branches, um, our word of mouth. Existing clients are a great source of, of, of finding new clients. Um, and then before we open a branch, we introduce ourselves to the local authorities, in, including the um, traditional authorities. And, and those people will often know their communities well and, and point us in the right direction or point clients to us. Uh, we then have a meeting with clients, give them a basic overview and introduce clients to the center. The center meeting has veto on groups joining Pagamani because of the social collateral within the, in both the group and the center. So, Clients are introduced at the centre and centre leadership will take a decision on whether they will admit a new group. 
into that center. Following that is a stage called group formation. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going through this to show the, the amount of contact uh, we have with the clients. Um, all members must attend that. The branch manager will visit each of their homes and confirm that they understand what is happening, make sure they've made family members aware, so their partner or parents or, or whoever they live with, that they are looking to take a loan and start a business, and, and then just an understanding of what that means in terms of repayments. Uh, and then they are approved for training. So this is the start of, of some of the, the, the financial literacy training, where they trained over three or four days, uh, not full days. Uh, we respect the fact that time out of, out of the business is expensive for our clients. Um, and we teach them a couple of system principles. You can do it, it's alone, it's a hand up, not a hand out. We believe a, a, it's more sustainable than, than charity, particularly to a business person. There's strength in the group, and they should follow uh, the system, which includes attending centre meetings, etc. And then some basic uh, business principles, uh, you know, buy the right stock, sell at the right price, right product, right product. We don't advise on what business clients should go to. We again respect that they know their communities better than we do, and will know where there's demand. Uh, and then they open a group savings account, which is the account we disperse into. Um, and then the branch will, uh, the manager will come back after the training, make sure that everyone attends, that the training has happened, clients understand key principles, and this is very important in ensuring that we don't over indebt anyone, uh, confirm the loan sizes, and confirm installment amounts uh, to be paid. Really important here, and that's why I keep saying all members must attend, is, is, is this model. And the reason we can achieve 98% repayment rates is because of the solidarity within the group and the, the cohesive strength of the group. Um, and, and so that's why that is encouraged. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. So this, this talks a little bit to the cost to serve. Um, so just briefly, those headings, agriculture uh, is primarily chickens. Uh, we, we don't have the model for microfinance for uh, crop farming and, and, and uh, stock farming is quite different in that there's a high upfront cost and then you sort of wait quite some time for harvest to get repayment. So we don't do that, but, but we do have some people in agri Multiple is where clients are running more than one business, so they might be selling food during the day and doing sewing at night or selling products like Tupperware and Average Lane in addition to airtime. So they have multiple businesses. Production, mainly sewing and knitting. Uh, services, catering, cosmetics, hair salons, tailoring. And then retail, the, the most significant portion is um, Buying and selling uh, new or used clothing, shoes, fruit and vegetables, tuck shops, spas, and restaurants. So I showed this because we have intentionally uh, focused and, and, and intend to maintain focusing on what is known as the bottom of the pyramid, not the nicest term. Um, so to recruit, train, and disperse a new client costs around 500 Rand. Um, so just to break even on that process, we need to disperse clients of over 2,800. And you can see 63% of our clients are below that, that level. Um, rural areas are obviously significantly more expensive to serve in terms of travel time, uh, travel expenses, because of the lower densities. Um, longer term loans over one, two, three years are cheaper to administer. Um, and, and just remember that we do meet with our clients uh, every every month um, in centre meetings, and each each loan officer would conduct several of those. Uh, we do business verification and social gather um, social data gathering at each loan cycle, so that we can monitor impact. Um, cost of labour in South Africa is relatively high. 
and then other developing economic e economies, our, our staff may not necessarily agree, but, but that is proven. And then higher loans and volume improve self-sufficiency ratios. So we really are at this stage looking to focus on helping our clients grow up, uh, grow their businesses and grow up, up uh, the loan size um, graph. Um, next one, please. Next slide. So the, the graph on, on the left, and this is really shows um, very clearly the impact of some of the decisions. So one back, please. Can we just go to the previous slide, please? Zamili, are you there? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, so you can see on that graph, if you look at the, the before 2015, there was a, a conscious decision and strategy to, to, to expand, uh, both from a social mandate, but also from a sustainability mandate. And it was at that time that we entered into the first partnering agreement with the Jobs Fund. Um, and opened into KwaZulu Natal. So you, the reason for, for the growth was to achieve a, um, a economies of, of, of scale in servicing clients and therefore be hit a critical mass where we could start becoming more sustainable. So you'll see if you go from 2015 to 2016, uh, that was the first year of the Jobs Fund project. And the dip in sustainability comes about due to the, the, the um, investment in opening new branches. But then there was a significant gain over the remainder of that project, which was three years uh, for the whole organization. And, and, and that really was one of the sweetest projects we've ever experienced because Kuzuni Natal, um, the previous development microfinance organization had shut down, um, staff had lost their jobs, and, and there was therefore a fertile ground of, of people who knew what they wanted and knew how to operate in microfinance. And we had the backing of Jobs Fund, so that was incredibly successful. 2017-18, uh, post that project, we continued opening in Limpopo, and you can see the impact of that investment there. And then the, the OSS started growing again until COVID hit. Our projections prior to COVID is that we would have reached sustainability by um, this, this last financial year being June 2023. Um, but you can see we are nowhere close to that currently. Um, and the recovery that started post COVID in 2021-22, uh, we've now flattened out within 23. Um, so that's the reality of the cost to serve it, Primarily is salaries and travel costs, and those those are relatively fixed in our environment. If you look at the right side graph, that just gives you an indication of where the revenue comes from. And currently, about 60% of our operating costs um, are absorbed, uh, are covered through the revenue we earn, and the balance comes through donations, um, the Pagamani Trust, and at this stage, the Jobs Fund. Um, about 31% of the operating costs come from that. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is why we come to work, and, and these are stats we, we collect at every loan cycle to, to, um, to understand what change there's been. So the first graph uh, shows that loan, loan amounts are growing. Now, uh, to take a bigger loan, you, you need to have saved, you need to have paid your loan off well, you need to have attended centre meetings, not all of them, but most of them. So, so the, the factors that determine a growing loan is really a healthy business. Um, and that's why we track that. And you can see the x-axis is, is um, successive loan cycles. So you can see on average, as clients um, 
enter into second, third, and fourth loans, those loan amounts grow. And why do they grow? One of the key factors that I haven't mentioned yet is that the business value is growing. So on a very simple balance sheet, we value the business at each successive uh, loan cycle and, in, and, and then collect those stats. And again, there you can see on average, as success, successive loans are taken, the business value typically grows. And clients are able to save. So another indicator of, of impact is savings. And then the final graph uh, measures uh, poverty out of uh, progress out of poverty, which is an international measurement, um, and, and it's customized for the countries that use it. And South Africa has its own customized um, PPI tool. And what that shows at a level, uh, you know, the first second load, 42 points, indicates that there's a 30% chance that that client will be below the national poverty line. Whereas if you go into successive loan cycle, at 52 points, it, it, it represents at about 5% probability that a client will be below the national poverty line. So, so quite a material change um, in their well-being over, the, over successive loans. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 best, the best measure or the best way of understanding Pagamani is through our clients. And we just got a few samples here just to share the kind of impact that a loan can make. So Nesta, who's local here in Mpumalanga, took her first loan of a thousand rand in 2011. She purchases scrap metals, melts it down, and, and uses a mold to, to make cauldron pots. Uh, she custom makes them by size and she'll even put your name on it. Um, in between that and, and for additional income, she hires out pots for special occasions. Um, and I think just how, how, how creative our clients can be and how hard they work across multiple ideas um, to, to, to bring out money for their, for, their, for their household. She's built a, a workshop and a house to put her child through school and she employs two women in her operation. So that's part of the, the knock-on impact that I was talking about earlier. Jane um, saw high demand for quality food in, in, in her community. She took a loan um, to purchase meat and pay for it to be transported, so bulk. Uh, business has done well. She's added onto a two-bedroom house. She now accommodates her whole family of seven and she's put three of her children through tertiary education. Very typical of, of um, women households, and the reason we service women is that the money that comes in will typically be, be passed on to the family. Maria took a loan in 2014. She has 26 loans since then. She's grown her seamstress business, she built a garage to work from, two new sewing machines, and has been able to support her family better. Uh, Sibongile took a loan of 1200 in two, 2018. Um, she used to sell cosmetics. She's diversified into multiple retail products. Um, she said she battled through COVID, but she's doing well again. Her daughter has, has studied further, and based on Several successful loans being paid off. She's currently on a loan of 25,000. So first loans, you can move on to the next slide. First loans start at 1,000 rand and go up to 3,500. And our maximum loan size at this stage is 30,000, which we review each year. Just some indication of, of how we've worked with the jobs fund in Brazilian Natal, which was March 2015 to Feb 2018. Over those three years, we, we trained 17,500 uh, beneficiaries, uh, created 4,133 beneficiary jobs, and dispersed capital of about 60 million. But because of the nature of the work we do, um, that continues. So in the past five years, we, we've trained an additional 42,000 beneficiaries, created nearly 11,500 jobs, and dispersed capital of 380 million. Um, 
So year on year is what is this is represented in the model there. So capital dispersed for in instance was around 20 million a year. It's now 76. Jobs created were just under 1,400. It's now 2,300 a year. And trade beneficiaries was 5,800 a year. It's now 8,400. Very quickly, the current project, which is much newer, Eastern Cape, on the next slide. Um, again, we see the positive um, outcomes of the project continue. So you'll see the margins are smaller, but we're only one year post the project. So whereas we trained 3,800 beneficiaries per year during the project, we've trained an additional 4,100 in the, in the year there, thereafter. Um, 772 jobs created per year is now 1,165. And capital is dispersed per year has moved from 17 to 28. Um, next slide, please. I'm conscious of time and I know there's some questions. So I'm going to go through some of the key learnings. Okay. Um, so really what, what we've seen um, is that development microfinance using the group methodology is highly effective in, in reaching rural people, uh, in our instance, women who are unbanked and unemployed. So high rates of success in assisting clients to start or grow their micro business and provide an income for their household. Uh, really importantly, and we've heard this from our clients, is that it creates hope for the current um, clients and it leverages uh, success for future generations. Um, it's expensive to operate in rural areas, uh, requiring a subsidy of at least 10 years. As you can see, we are still requiring subsidy after 15 years. And we believe what we've seen is that subsidy has come through government grants, um, individuals, Pagamani, uh, US and Canada provide large donations to us. Um, preferential loan rates through government. These are things that would help going forward. Bank charges are, are quite material to our clients, very material. Uh, and we see those rates going up. So we'd, we'd love to see a savings product or group savings uh, specifically to, to the sector, and then obviously reduce bank charges to ourselves. Bank charges being our third biggest expense. Then opportunities to reduce operating costs. Uh, we're busy looking to digitize our loan processes uh, to save on, on courier fees and printing costs. Um, mobile banking, um, there are initiatives already, um, one under the Reserve Bank that's in pilot, that hopefully will get our clients using mobile banking, in which case we could save money in terms of our, our transactions between ourselves and them. And then really for success, you need a strong donor base and, and grants right from the beginning and, and sort of patient capital until, until the organization can stand on its own feet. Thanks everyone. I, I'm done with the presentation. I realize I didn't give my colleague much chance to speak, but I was conscious of time. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I think um, people can start raising uh, their hands for questions. We will uh, be un unmuting the mic shortly, but just some questions that has been posted in the chat, Eric, that, that you may have answered, but I think it's worth uh, just answering them quickly again. Mzamu asks, is the interest rate the same as commercial banks? And then Cindy Siwe asks, how does Pakamani address the tension between its social mandate and sustainability? I think you've actually answered that question on one of your slides. Sandeep wants to know, what does proliferation of strip malls mean? You had that in one of your slides. Is something that's impacting your, your, your operations? If you can answer those three for me quickly, I have two more, but if you can just answer those three for me first, please. Okay, so, so we are governed by the, the National Credit Act and the National Credit Regulator, and um, there are specific rates uh, allowed for development lending, um, and we stay within those rates. They are, um, yeah, we, we actually stay 
coming below those rates. In terms of the banks, on, on they don't lend to this market, so we can't really compare to that. But if you compare to informal lenders and unregulated lenders, it's significantly lower than the rates in the market. To give you an indication in terms of interest rates on a thousand rand loan is about six and a half percent over four months. Thank you. In terms of the tension between sustainability and um, and social mandate, I think Kudzi addressed that in quite a bit of detail. Yeah. Um, so, but we're happy to to be contacted outside of this this forum if, if anyone wants more detail. And sure. the last question was around um, the strip malls, Eddie. Okay, so, the of, yeah. so, so in very outlines um, obviously of convenience to this to the the customers they serve. Where bigger sort of malls come in and offer more variety and possibly cheaper rates than our clients because they're buying and selling in bulk, that affects our clients' businesses, which in turn affects us. And we have seen a number of these malls going up in the rural areas in which we operate. So that's what I meant by that. Okay. Um, then the, 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 the question, there was a question, there was an unknown user, there was no name attached. Do you have insights on stock files and other non-formal or, or non-formal um, lending that occurs in the informal economy? What incentives could be used to encourage uh, micro enterprises to move towards being banked? And, and have you captured the unbanked market? Okay, so we are aware of other uh, financial systems that exist in the communities that we serve. So we we are aware of the stock fails, we are aware of uh, reciprocal uh, interest-free loans that um, the people give each other, and we are also aware of the machonistas who are operating uh, uh, where we, we serve our clients. Now, microfinance is based on the idea that all of these financial systems they are hampered by problems, and as such, they lack um, resources and inability to meet members of the stock field needs, uh, such as the inability to pay for funeral expenses or the grocery needs of larger families, a lack of economies of scale because money accumulates more slowly and there's more room for expansion. Stock fields, they unfortunately provide beneficial uh, indigenous savings methods that communities adopt. However, anything beyond that may be too administrative and difficult to manage. So as microfinance institutions, we are more structured in, in, in how we do things and we're focused uh, primarily on financial inclusion. With Mashonisas, I'm sure you're aware um, uh, what type of tactics they engage in just to recover their repayments. Uh, this is besides the high interest rates they charge. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. And then one from Andisa, Eric, and, and Kutsi. What initial funding is required uh, for a development uh, a microfinance institution to achieve sustainability? And if I may, I'd like to ask to that, um, ask additional to that, if you can add to that, how better can government assist this industry to expand its impact? I'll, I'll take the first half of that and maybe could you allow on to the second half. So sustainability is the measure we use is purely um, revenue earned uh, over the cost to, to earn that revenue. Grants and donations obviously help the organization run and stay afloat, but don't this for that reason don't impact sustainability. So when we measure sustainability, we exclude grants. Obviously, on our income statement, grants and donations come in, and that's the cash flow we need to keep the operation going. In terms of funding our clients, we have multiple um, loans which we're able to service and, and on lend to our clients. So it's the operational side, yeah, significant amount of funding, particularly in the first five to ten years. Okay. And, and the issue around how best government better. Uh, a better way for government to, to, to assist this industry? 
Um, we believe first and foremost uh, a sound legal and policy framework in support of development of microfinance activities. For example, the capitalization of microfinance institutions, as, as Eric has mentioned, uh, is critical and uh, needs to be given a considerable attention. Uh, we're looking at uh, even issues at, at, at the macroeconomics taxation of the, M the MFI supplies. You know, the VAT that uh, we charge on our services, that's an additional 15% cost on our clients, and that concerns us. And we're looking at banking legislation over the years, statutory and banking legislation has prevented the use of uh, financial technology to deliver financial products and services like we see in Kenya where the MPS are. In South Africa, that's, that we haven't gotten to that point as yet, and yet that can significantly lower the cost for, for, for microfinance. And at a high level, communities without essential infrastructure like decent roads, reliable power supplies, and good transit systems, they are almost not able to benefit from microfinance products. So uh, the government can, can, can address that at a, a higher level. And then there was a question from uh, Nokuzola's uh, question was answered. Um, and please, if everybody can notice that um, the the website and the email have for Pakamani has been posted. So if you need to talk to Pakamani directly, please do so. There was a question. Um, do I have to be a registered on CIPC to access a loan? Absolutely not. Um, okay. Because of the size, um, yeah, it is informal and just maybe tacking on to that needs to remain informal. These are very small businesses and I think any any um, attempt to formalize it, registering for, with SARS and SIPSI and that will just kill the sector completely. This is much too small for that and I don't believe there would be any benefit um, either government or all these institutions in doing that. Yeah. And then I saw I a question from Bianca as well, which I'll quickly answer. Um, because of the social mandates, it's, 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 we don't we don't take action on clients. Um, because it's group lending, uh, we don't report clients or blacklist clients. We can't report them to a credit bureau because of the nature of the group. Um, they 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 co uh, they co uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Not co fund, they, yeah, they, they stand in for each other. So, so not the night call. yeah, if, if somebody fails, we believe the group has failed. The only penalty is we will not give another loan to a group that has a write off. Yeah. Okay. I think if um, there's another question here from Tato who says, I've just started a business. We are one to lend to small agricultural enterprises. Um, but after I did a feasibility study, sure that the company will be able to, it's not sure that the company will be able to pay back the loan. What should I do to qualify collaboration with the jobs fund? I think that's more a question for the jobs fund. I will ask one of the jobs fund client, um, Kath, if you can please answer that question for Tato. Um, is there any questions? I don't see any hands up at the moment of people with questions. Yes. So Nazim, there's a question that was asked earlier. Maybe if I can briefly try and uh, answer it with regards to how a microfinance institution can ensure fulfillment of its uh, financial and social mission. Just yeah. to, to, to be clear, yes. Uh, first and foremost, we stay focused on our social mission by keeping the loan size inclusive um, and, and law, despite it being not profitable, because we have a social mission, we don't aim uh, to seek um, a profiteering first. We continue focusing on development rather than consumption loans, and also we continue supporting women in rural communities, even if it makes more sense to support those in townships or in urban uh, areas, we remain uh, fixed on, on, on these clients. And um, that's basically what we, we call uh, outreach, fulfilling our outreach mandate. Thank you, uh, Kutsi. Really appreciate that. And um, there's been a lot of requests for sharing of presentations. That will be done. It's also available on the GTAC website. Um, 
please can I request humbly that people take a minute to um, complete the, 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 the form, um, the rating form, so that we can also improve in the way that we do this going forward. I, I don't see any hands from people, so thank you, Eric. Thank you, uh, Kutsi, Mitchell. Um, Anita, you've got a hand up? Yes, no, sorry, Nazim, you've covered me. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, so with no further questions, let me just see, there may have been one more in the chat. Okay. We'll do, oh my word, now it's coming fast, right? Um, Gabriel, do you think, ask, do you think the microfinance model can be applied to urban settings, example, townships? It can, and it's, it, it has. I haven't seen a successful um, implementation in South Africa. I think one of the, the keys of our success in rural settings and working with women is that's the family house. There's stability. Um, we, we Some of the criteria is that clients have lived there for two years, that they've known each other for two years. There's a lot more of a um, mobility in, in, in um, more urban areas, and, and that can raise issues when, when somebody in a group um, uh, is unable to service the loan and can, and can lead to the whole group collapsing. So, Thanks. yeah, it could be done. It has been done elsewhere in the world, but we, we, we don't do that. Okay. Then, Leanne, um, you, I'm sure the Pakamani uh, uh, team would be happy to engage you. The, the website, it has been posted. Um, Yvette asked, is there one particular client story that has stood out for you? Because I think that's why we do this, right? Yeah. Um, so there are lots, and it is it is what keeps us coming to work. Um, but when I joined uh, late 2015, I remember visiting a client who was, well, it wasn't the client in the video, but a client who was cutting hair on the side of the road um, under a bit of a tin shack. And I visited again, coincidentally, about three years later, and she had built a salon. She had running water with basins for washing hair. And I applauded her and said, this is a fantastic thing that you've achieved. And she said, that's not all. She had built herself a house, and she had built three uh, rooms that she was letting out within three years. And I just think for, for you know, a woman to, to have that drive and that initiative and ability, uh, which we see in most of our clients, uh, yeah, that, I, I haven't forgotten that, and it's about six years old as a story. I think Palesa had a hand up. Palesa, you've dropped your hand. Does that mean you've been answered, or, or, or no. you still want to ask your question? Yes, I still want to ask a question. Uh, I just yes. want to find out if ever we are based in Gauteng, can you also apply? Um, we, we don't have operations in Kharteng. Uh, we have operations in uh, Kwantlanga and Siabuswa, which are the closest. And some of the clients might reside across the border, but, but we're not active in Kharteng currently, no. But it is watch the space, right, Eric? Yeah, yeah, look, we, 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 we're looking we're into it a little bit at the moment. We, we're consolidating for, for growth. We certainly will be growing again uh, in the future, but yeah, uh, there's still opportunity in Eastern Cape, there's still opportunity in Northwest, and, and that would also then obviously be hard 10 uh, in the middle of that. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Kutsi. Thank Thanks, you. Mitchell, for, for, for addressing the questions in the chat. Um, there's no, I don't see any further questions or any hands. I think I'm going to hand back to Vuyo. For, for for closing comments. Thanks for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nazim. Ladies and gentlemen, we're, we've come to the end of our webinar session this afternoon. We hope that you found this session useful as we've explored the Pagamani microfinance project and its impact in the lives of women in South Africa. It is fitting that we close out this Women's Month with an inspiring initiative such as the Pakamani Project, which is successfully uplifting some of the most vulnerable women in our society.
We hope that this uh, webinar has shed light on the transformative power of microfinance, not only in its potential to support the revitalization of rural economies, but also in empowering rural women and allowing them to take up their rightful place in their households and society. The Pakamani project has exemplified how targeted lending can empower women and create sustainable livelihoods in rural areas. Through a combination of technology, collaboration and deep community involvement, Pagamani has successfully brought financial services to those who need it most. By providing access to capital, training and mentorship, Pagamani has empowered women, enabling them to grow their loan sizes and businesses, break the chains of poverty in their families, become agents of change within their communities, and by so doing, creating a more equitable society. So on behalf of GTAC and the Jobs Fund, I want to extend a special word of thanks to yourself, Eric and Kudzai, uh, for sharing the Pakamani story with us today. To the participants, thank you for your engagement and enthusiasm for this topic. Ladies and gentlemen, let us carry the lessons learned today into the various work areas of work that we are involved in in our daily lives and continue championing initiatives that empower women and promote inclusive economic growth. And with that, we want to say thank you very much. Have a good afternoon further and we wish you a good weekend as well. Cheers, everybody. Bye, bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.